leprechauns in their life. <laughs> you are special. So Mike, I was just telling Hara a little bit um, about your background. She was telling, getting me up to speed on what's going on in her world. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm super psyched because one, I miss you and I love time with you. And whenever I get time with you, I feel incredibly grateful, inspired, empowered, and supported. You kind of manifest that trifecta in one beautiful being. You're awesome. so smart and you have so much expertise and so much love and, and care and you're amazing. So every time I get to spend time with you, I leave a better human. Um, and we I haven't really need to hire you as my publicist. I'm sorry. Go I on. could be your publicist. In fact, in fact, I think that's kind of part of my job through this because I'm certainly not like I'm on that health hacker summit today and I'm like, wow, there's such smart people. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know, right? I was, I mean, I was a microbiology biochemistry major. So like, I, I mean, I was, yeah, I mean, I was, I was smart. I still am, at Yale, I still am smart. It's just that mm. my brain, I'm a generalist and I'm not a specialist. And that's just one of the things like some of us are specialists. Some of us are generalists, generalists. Some of us are kind of both. And I actually took that's something called the Highland salt battery test something like that, or ability, Highland ability battery or something about, it was a much more expanded intelligence test. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that they were assessing was how much of a generalist are you? How much of a specialist are you? And I'm kind of off the chart gen generalist. And I was like, oh, that's oh, interesting. interesting. Which makes sense. Cause like, as soon as I got to calc, calc like four, I was like, no. Nah. And as soon as I got like really, really deep into microbiology, I was just like, no, oh, this is too much work. This is just like, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't just doesn't feel what I'm like I'm meant to be doing. I think I should go to a party now or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was too extroverted and playful to uh, really succeed at Yale in that deep. Is that my side? Are you hearing that kind of feedback? Yeah, I hear a little. It sounds like a grinding. Hmm. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Who needs headphones? Maybe if it's right. Headphones. We'll see. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, so I, I've been, you know, cause we're human and we're all human and we're all like, well, what's my role in all this? Cause I know I, I know I, I, I practice loving myself and celebrating my strengths and, and not beating myself up when I'm not perfect because <clears throat> I'm not perfect often, but I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion that I'm a generalist and I love people. And so I think that I'm meant to kind of like bring awesome people together and then amplify and share and like, you know, help kind of just make good stuff happen with lots of really awesome people. And so that's, I think, what I'm meant to do because um, I'm certainly not a doctor. And I, as soon as we get to a certain level around, you know, biochemistry and enzymes, I'm just like, yeah, I don't, I don't even feel <laughs> called to like memorize that anymore. I'm just like, all right, just tell me what I need to know. Like, okay, yeah. make these supplements, see how I feel. And then I'm really, I like being intuitive, which is one of the reasons I love getting to talk to you because I know that you also are really, really intuitive and you've been able to kind of connect a lot of intuitive and subtle kind of sensations, perhaps. I don't know. I'm going I'm to let you try to decide. But you, mm -hmm. you're all about performance. You coach professional, collegiate level athletes, sometimes mm -hmm. people like me, <laughs> <laughs> neither collegiate or professional level athletic you know, prowess. But you, you help people perform. You help people figure out where their body isn't functioning, right? How do you describe what you do? Um, basically all I just tell people, I'm a strength conditioning coach that just looks a little bit deeper. That's really all it is. That's um, all that people need to know. It's almost like if you tell them more than that, it could like. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's just a matter of, um, you know, there, there's a bridge between performance and rehab that it, I feel like neither party really looks at. Mm -hmm. And that, that void is very large. Yeah. And there is a need to have that filled. And that's kind of the aspect I tend to go into. Mm -hmm. And so when you say rehab, go deeper. Mm -hmm. deeper. Well, rehab anything. Um, I mean, you know, I had one case where I have a kid who had a case of something called Skiffy, mm -hmm. which is basically where the, um, a lot of the soft tissue rips away from the ASIS area. So the, the hip bone. And it's, it sounds really bad, but the rehab... You know, too many people like it's for the population that normally gets it versus where this kid had it. The rehab was geared for like an 80 year old. And this is a healthy 17 year old that just landed wrong. Right. So his rehab had to be different from 
you know, they were like, okay, stand up out of a chair. He was like, I could do that when everything was torn. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was a matter of finding, basically just, just finding where the missing pieces are, finding, finding the flaws. Okay. And so talk about how you do that. That's different than how maybe traditionally people are taught to do. Well, yeah, I do. um, I'll do an assessment, mostly muscle testing, some range of motion. Um, I like to get my hands on people, which is kind of a lost thing in society today because everyone's afraid to touch. I mean, now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just a matter of, you know, finding where the holes are and then plugging that and doing like what I do is I'll, I'll test people. I'll see what's on, what's off. And then I try to turn on whatever's off. Mm -hmm. Or if there's something overactive, you try to bring it back down because if it's overactive, it's doing the job of something else. Right. So like what we see with a lot of people, especially with this young man, um, had no real psoas activity. So, you know, hip musculature. And um, so his quad was doing all the work, his quad and his calf actually, or his quad and tibialis, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so they were really overreaching for what they were doing. And he ended up popping something because of it. And once we turn the, uh, the hip musculature back on, rehab was much smoother and shorter. Yeah. And that's the thing. And it, <clears throat> it's such an enigma for, you know, I'm not like a complete layman, right? I, I went, I'm a certified personal trainer and I have a, obviously a strong biology background. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I was training. You, you have a higher background than most. Well, yeah. But, it, but it's, you know, it's funny. Education, we all know, right? Education <laughs> It's like, okay, like you can study and pass a test and then forget it all the next day, right? <laughs> and there are people that never kind of took a test, never got the degree, never got the letters mm. that have mm. been studying and applying and evolving. And, and they're infinitely wiser than people that have the letters after their name, right? And so, of course, of course. you know, um, I think because of the way that my life went, becoming a mom and being focused on that for a long time. And then, So that's when I kind of, it's not like I forgot my biochemistry and chemistry and biology and molecular. It's like I remembered the things that were important to me, which again, Mm -hmm. I think the general things. I'm all about relationships and patterns and and kind of cracking a code in that like, I always think that there's analogies that are really helpful. And so like when you you were talking about plugging the holes in Mm -hmm. rehab and thinking about, okay, there's a whole system here and the system in order to be in homeostasis and to be operating kind of optimally, everything has to be in balance. And you find the holes of where something is either over or under performing and therefore the whole is not as strong because there is an individual that's either over or under active, right? Immediately where I go with that, I'm like, that is a fucking perfect analogy for like all of life, right? Individually, (laughs) like in our body, our collective society. And so that, that kind of was the biggest takeaway for me from all of like my hard science was like one, I know nothing because as soon as I started going really deep into science, I was like, no one, no one really knows. Because once you start studying, you're like, oh, wait, well, that may apply to certain people, but not to everybody. And you can't really tell who that is because even now, like with all genetics testing, genetics is just probability. So it's like, all right, you have a higher probability that you've got this particular deficiency or whatever, whatever, but we don't really know, um, Mm -hmm. which is why biohacking is so cool and all that. I swear I'm going somewhere with this. But my point was that, was that like, I don't, I know I know nothing, right? And so I, mm-hmm. I maybe have been exposed to a lot of science and know maybe more generally than the average person, but I still know nothing. And when I was mm. cracked, when I was, I decided I was going to run a marathon and I'm not a long distance runner. I've never been a long distance runner. Me running a marathon was, was not something that I ever even wanted to do. It was really kind of a, a friend asked me to do it with her. And I was like, oh, okay. Like running the Paris marathon sounds fun. So sure, I'll do it. And then it like sucked, like it really sucked <laughs> having to run that much. And then I started getting pain. And, and afterwards, I don't, I don't know, like are people supposed to ever be able to run a marathon without pain? Because a bunch of people were like, like no. And because I was trying, not, I was trying at the time, I was trying to, I uh, taught myself to stop saying trying. So, but back then I really was still trying. I was trying to not have pain because I was like, well, I'm going to do this. I don't want to do it with pain. And so once I started getting pain, like right around like the 17 mile run mark, I know, right? I was starting to get this pain in my leg. Thing. So then I started going to doctors because I was like, I'm not supposed to have pain. And I think that the takeaway was I wasn't supposed to run so fucking much. <laughs> I mean, when, but anyway, 
Yeah, when you look at the marathon and realize the guy who ran the original one died I, right at the end of it, yes. it's probably not something we well, should have made but a sport. That should have been a red flag. Overactive versus underactive. And I'm not saying everyone who runs a marathon is overdoing it. But I know from my biology, I'm more of a power person. I'm not meant to do yeah. that for that long. But the original point of this story, I swear there was one, was that when I – had all the pain and I started going to all of these kind of specialists and top doctors in the field and PT and no one mm -hmm. had any idea. Like one guy yeah. was like, Oh, it's your fascia. Another guy was like, Oh, it's because you know, your, your core is, is over underactive and that's overactive. And so do these exercises, all these different PT exercises I was doing. And then in the end, I ended up seeing this random chiropractor in Colorado. His name is Tom Pallack. And he did a bunch of more weird stuff, right? Like he did some stuff with lasers and we talked about old traumas that I had. And at that point I was getting pain. If I ran 10 miles, I was in pain. I was like, how the hell am I going to run the marathon? Because I'm like, both. I'm getting pain in 10 miles. Um, and he did some weird stuff. And then for the first time I had no pain and then I ran the marathon and I didn't start to really get uncomfortable until around 18 miles in. And I, you know, finished fine. Um, but anyway, I don't think anyone knows. That's my point. Is like the knowledge of what the how the body works and based on how we're taught it, it's limited. And the thing about you, when you say go deeper, it's like I think that you're able to kind of sense the whole, and and then also sense the individual. Like you're using both things like muscle testing and seeing where things are off. But then you're also kind of I don't know. I just get the sense that you're tapping into something that's awesome that most people cannot tap into. So mm. you know. You know. You know. You know. So you feel where muscles are not firing and you get them that's, to work. How do you do that? How do you just, get them back on? Um, mostly through, well, there, there's a number of different ways. Um, I do a lot of lymphatic stuff to turn things back on. I like do what? a lot of, so like just certain lymph nodes. So if you ever look at um, lymph, which is really the forgotten system, if you ever want to learn about lymph, look up Dr. Perry Nicholson. He's got some great stuff. Perry Nicholson? Um, Nicholson. Nicholson. Right. Yeah. He actually works around the corner from me, too, so it's really funny. Get him. Go get him. <laughs> I do. Well, I'm not at work. Oh, okay. <laughs> I actually, I know where he lives. He lives. He doesn't live far from me. <laughs> He's like, get away, you stalker. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, if you ever look at lymph, that's kind of like the uh, the pathway. Okay. Um, okay. So lymph, blood, and nerve all run together. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of people don't realize. They all follow the same path. Mm -hmm. Lymph is probably, in my opinion, the most important because it doesn't have its own biological pump. Okay. So the nervous system does, you know, obviously that's our brain and our sensory feedback system. Circulatory system, we have this little thing called your heart. Little. Which moves everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the lymph doesn't have a system. The lymph is meant to be moved by movement. Yeah. Yeah. And since we don't do that, we're a lot more sedentary nowadays. That's where we're seeing a lot more of these issues coming from. Interesting. So there's various ways to move your lymph. What I tend to do is kind of a palpatory technique where I go in and find where the blockage is, which is mm -hmm. really just feel and you look for what we jokingly cause the po call the positive jump test if i push on that area and you try to jump off the table that's what you're doing to me i see pretty much pretty I'm much you don't jump that, that much <laughs> you just start going into your deep breathing I, and, and i giggle and, yeah <laughs> I'm yeah a and, that, that, and a deep breather yeah that's where i'm tipped off and that's when i'm like oh okay here's where we Down have to on. go <laughs> yeah so and then we just work that area and then retest the muscle and so we can do that to ourselves Oh, 100 percent so how do you tell the difference between a soft spot in the lymph or, or a jump spot, right? Mm -hmm. A tender, a tender spot in the lymph and like mm -hmm. other kinds of tender spots? Well, lymph nodes are located in certain areas. Okay. So it's always so, a node. Yeah. So there's always like you have your circulatory system uh -huh. and it comes into almost like a reservoir okay. and then it drains out again. And those reservoirs are really what you're looking at. Okay. That's okay. what we call our nodes. Oh, Yes. I love learning things. Who doesn't? <laughs> I know, it's the best. Okay, so those are the spots that you then kind of, and how does that, that's part of the reactivation process? So there's Yeah, because those, those nerve bundles sit very superficial to them. So when you press on that lymph, you're actually stimulating that nerve. And what happens is when that lymph builds up, so if your reservoir is supposed to look like this, uh -huh. 
and all of a sudden it looks like this, mm -hmm. it's now compressing your circulation and your neural flow. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Fascinating. Okay. Mm. So that often, but not always, will reactivate a muscle? Nine, in what I've seen nine times out of 10, if there's something else, if it doesn't reactivate something, um, generally there's something off in a neurogenic center, which is something a bit deeper. Um, Tell me. Or, <laughs> well, I'll get to it. Or it's um, like something's torn. Oh. And you just don't have that connective tissue to pull. Oh. If that makes sense. Yes. To, you know, I'm familiar because with when that. you, yeah, when you muscle test someone, you pretty much just put them in a position where they can't fire other stuff Got it. without being obvious. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I test a shoulder and I see someone go like this, I'm like, okay, well, you're cheating. Please Cheater. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> then I'll just hold their head still and do it. Um, so yeah, the neurogenic centers is a little bit different. So there's uh, three, mm -hmm. um, three main ones. Uh, the uh, cervical spine, the lumbar spine, and the cranium actually. Okay. And there's all different techniques. The same thing, it's a muscle test. Um, and you actually have individuals place their hands in certain areas. And, um, you know, the sensory feedback, obviously the hands are one of the largest sensory feedback mm -hmm. parts of the body we have. So that activates more of the brain. Um, does connective tissue come into play with muscular homeostasis? Uh, what do you mean by that with muscular homeostasis, Hara? We can unmute um, you. Okay, you're muted. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, you can talk. I was just wondering how connective tissue comes into play with how our muscles work because we have connective tissue lining all our organs. Yep. Fascia? Yeah. 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 So organs are supposed to move. Um, you know, like uh, every time you take a diaphragmatic breath, your liver should move about three millimeters. Right. So if your connective tissue is kind of gunked up and not working properly, you're not going to get that motion. Um, and that, that affects the function or functionality of that organ. Right. So as people age, their connective tissue can become more gelatinous. It's less fluid. And, yes. does, that, and does that restrict movement of muscles, muscular motion? It can. It definitely can. An expansion of muscles, yeah. Yep. I mean, the best thing to do for that is basically just keep moving. And I also, you know, if possible... Um, have someone work on you. Like, uh, I think lymphatic drainage massage is excellent. Um, any type of, I, I think too many people go overboard with the massage. They kind of, you know, they think they need to get hurt when they're on the table and that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if you're, if you're having something progress from a lighter to a more aggressive uh, massage type of session, I think mm -hmm. that would be a benefit. I've been taking um, Moshe Feldenkrais classes for about 15 years, and okay. I noticed that people in the class who are like even in their 90s are moving like their 20s and 30s from That's these awesome. awareness and movement. And it's very subtle, and it seems like nothing's happening, but it seems like everything's happening. But they yeah. are able to keep their mobility. And even if they fall, they just bounce right back up. They don't, you know, they, they don't fracture and break hips. And, you know, so. That's awesome. There's something about the subtle movements that Feldenkrais came up with that seems to be helping with. No doubt. Know. Well, he's also, Feldenkrais stuff has been around for, ooh, what is it, 70 or 80 years now? Yes. So if there is a following that's going that long, it tends to mean there's at least a few right things in there. I mean, I don't think any one system is 100% correct, but if it's around that long, it's, there's definitely got to be a lot right to it. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was even able to work with patients in wheelchairs and get them out of wheelchairs using his method. Yeah, there's so much that, you know, we lost through the FDA um, when they first started doing things. And, um, you know, like supposedly Royal Rife was curing people of cancer in weeks mm -hmm. um, with his technology. And supposedly that wasn't the way they wanted to go. So they bought him out and destroyed all his research. Well, yeah. <sighs> gotta, love our, gotta love our powers that be. Mm. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I mean, all this stuff is, it's so, because again, we're, com we're such complicated systems. Our bodies are so complicated. And that's why ultimately 
when I was going down the rabbit hole of science, I, I'm glad I, I mean, I kind of stopped at some point because once I got to quantum physics, I was like, no one, this doesn't, no one understands anything. This makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And then meditation ended up being kind of the practice or the practice of spiritual science where even though you can't um, kind of test anything externally, mm -hmm. like you can't so far, I mean, obviously we're making a lot of strides with, you know, neurobiology and being able to measure brain waves and, and have mm -hmm. a lot of people all kind of verify that they're experiencing the same thing. But the spiritual science that seemed to kind of connect the dots, that the things that I experience intuitively and I experience when I'm present and in mm -hmm. a higher brain state, that that's when I can know things that, that, that almost like my, mm -hmm. my lower brain can't know. Like if I'm in a dualistic state, I can't possibly know something. But if I'm in mm -hmm. a higher state of consciousness, I can know things that I couldn't possibly know. And at first it freaked me out still kind of does freak me out, but now I just think it's funny. And I'm like, huh. And then as soon as I think about it, then I can't do it. <laughs> you know, like, wait, I lost it. Oh, no. I, I, wait, I went back into my head. Hold on. Nope. Let me get yeah. back there. Cause it's like that relaxation. You have to relax and let go in order to let yourself get into those higher states. And then you will suddenly know things and it freaks you out. So then you drop and you're like, oh no, wait, hold on. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. I get the sense it's kind of what you're doing. I mean, not, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying there always is a bit of there always is a bit of intuition with anything you have to do yeah because well, i mean books are just guidelines yeah well, that's one of the things i mean every time every time you and i work together like we always i, I, I want to i can't wait till i can spend more time with you but i'm so curious because i'm i'm working very hard i'm in the process of releasing right the stuff that all the blocks that i have whether they're in my lymph or whether they're in my muscles or where the heck all the energy is blocked or how it's blocked if it's in my fascia whatever it, however it connects some of the mm -hmm. stuff i experience i know it's like in more of my subtle nervous system body which doesn't really make any sense you know but and that's what i experience and i'm always so curious every time i see him like it's electric that makes perfect any, sense i feel any well it, it does to us i guess but um but yeah, I'm like, does it, is it any better? Like, is my neck any less, <laughs> any less jacked? But yeah, I mean, I just feel like when, okay, so we talked about getting muscles turned back on. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about the overactive muscles. Like what are the techniques that you use to get the overactive muscles to relax? Well, believe it or not, one of the big ones is nine times out of 10, if a muscle's overactive, it's because something's not working. Mm -hmm. So something else. One of those yeah. other muscles is asleep. Yeah, and something has become overactive because now it's doing two jobs instead of one. Okay. And that's just what we can do is, as humans, we have that ability to compensate. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the stuff comes from. That's like, um, you know, when you see injuries that don't make sense. Um, I remember a few years ago, there was a fight promoter who was, something had happened and he ran into the ring because it was, he didn't agree with the decision. And as he got into the ring, literally stepping through the rope, something he'd done a couple thousand times, he tore both quads. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Exactly. And a lot of that is most likely due to the fact that something wasn't functioning the way it should be. Right. And, you know, something else was doing the job of, you know, other musculature, which will ultimately lead to an issue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So... One of the big things I'll do is step one, what I normally do is I always try to find what's off and turn it back on. And then like, um, there's certain applications you can use. One of the things I'll do is either like a, um, there's a technique I learned a few years ago called Trigenics. Okay. Uh, where I will use some of that stuff to get a muscle to, uh, they have two techniques, lengthening and strengthening. I'll go with the lengthening mm -hmm. at that point and just kind of get that muscle to relax and get the tissue to yield really uh -huh. because it kind of goes into a defensive position where it's protecting something. Yeah. And you basically have to let it know that it doesn't need to protect whatever it's protecting. Got it. Unless there's an injury there, obviously. Right. Right. Which is what seems to be like the things that I've um, seen at hacked over the last year and a half, like the way that um, the newbie can mm. help us, you know, and instantly kind of heal pain. Um, oh yeah. I have the original version of the newbie. Yeah. I know you're super familiar with it, but it's like, it's like you're kind of retraining the brain. They're like, no, you're fine. <laughs> like stop. Yeah. Right? It's like, that's, that's like, really what it really. is. Chill out. Yeah. It's fine. Then I have my dog here, but it's like the same, like the monkey mind, like a dog 
barking at the mailman. Like, no, mm. really, it's the same guy that comes every day. Like, this is not a threat. <laughs> exactly. Unless he's bringing bills. Yeah, that's, especially right now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just, I, I'm just always fascinated. Because first of all, you, you have magic powers, right? When I say magic powers, you can, you can do things that, that other people cannot do. And it's always inspiring and it's a gift. And I'm just super grateful. First of all, that I get to know you and I get to be your friend and you just delight me every time I get to see you. And oh, so that is quite mutual. I'm really grateful that you, you take the time. Harry, do you have any other, any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering to what extent does our sed this sedentary lifestyle that many of us have gotten into and also our poor alignment through poor posture, um, how is mm -hmm. that affecting our muscular um, functioning? Oh, it's, it, it, it has a tendency to shut everything down. Um, posture is one of my friends literally teaches eight hour courses on postures to increase performance. So um, whenever you essentially think of your bone structure as just that, a structure, and when you take it and compromise it, whether it be through poor posture or through not, you know, when we move, we actually lubricate things and we make things work better. And when you're not doing that, you're actually compromising the structure and making it weaker. So like, for example, one of the things with me when I was younger, you know, as a guy who likes to lift weights, um, we all immediately gravitate towards the bench press because that's going to make us a lot of money and make girls like us, right? Or, or, or so we think. Clearly. Yes, yes, or so we think. Number two. <laughs> yeah, because girls are so impressed by that. Um, and I had developed a very round-shouldered posture. So my shoulders, instead of being at the end of my clavicles, had rotated forward. We call that internal rotation. And I had still gotten very strong, but I wasn't able to. I was, I was bench pressing somewhere around 375, 385. Whoa. Could never break 400 <laughs> for the life of me. And literally one of my friends was like, well, hey, stupid, why don't you train your shoulders a little bit better? And I was like, oh, yeah, I probably could do that. And within weeks, I hit my goal of something that I've been chasing for two years. Mm -hmm. And it literally took two, two and a half weeks to get to just by doing the proper thing and getting my posture where it needed to be. Well, yeah. where, where, where are you based? Uh, where, where, do you, where are you? Located? I'm in northern New Jersey. Oh, OK. So you're in you're in the New York area. Yeah, how about yourself? I'm in Manhattan. I've been going to Hacked with Pam. Oh, okay. That makes sense. I'm working, I've been working with Alan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, Alan's great. He's great, yeah. He's probably one of the best drummers in Hacked as well. Yes. Really? He's a drummer? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. He's musician. Super talented yeah. musician. He's creating a lot of the music that Sage is playing when he does Oh, that. I didn't even know that. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, doesn't he like produce a lot too? Like mm -hmm. Alan plays like uh, seven instruments or yeah, something. Yeah. He's, he's amazing. Amazing yeah. musician. That yeah, dude's another level. Yeah. He's well, the people that I hang out with are pretty cool. I will just say, <laughs> you know, yeah. I will just, I'll just put it out there that I'm pretty lucky. We have to bring him back from Florida after the coronavirus. Well, he's he's back. He's actually oh, he's back. Oh, I thought he was still down in Florida with his. No, he's back. He's he's local. Um, he's actually running around today making recordings of um, New York City sounds for Sage to use and the band to use in their music. So. Oh, how cool! That's great. Oh my god. That's great, Sage. Could you throw him in front of a moving car while you're at it? I know. I think Alan. I mean, I think at this point, Alan had to have been exposed and, and is fine. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. If you're living in New York City right now, it's you know. Yeah, it kind of is what it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Mike, I know I want to talk a little bit about some of your other initiatives, right? So the Hol Holotype mm -hmm. brand, what's the latest on that? And can you explain what that is for those who might not know? Yeah, sure. Holotype is very, it's basically um, the first, well, once we get something published, the first proven line of clothing that uh, actually increases performance. So it utilizes resonance frequency, which is basically just another term for basic, um, putting your nervous system in key. Mm -hmm. uh, like tuning something up mm -hmm. so like when you tune an instrument and you use like a tuning fork to do it that's essentially what we're doing and it's simply just by putting on uh, an infused piece of clothing that we sell mm -hmm. and uh, yeah we see better function and better operation of the musculature yep and you also have little you have other kind of little 
clips. Oh, clips. I'm like, what is that called? Uh, those are called neural reset clips. Same technology. Right. Um, but just a different application. I wanted to go with the t-shirts and the, we're actually, we're, we're making socks now. Yes. Um, Everybody loves yeah, socks. socks. Super well, yeah, and they're, well, they're great oh, also. Super could, socks? We could call them super socks. I am not against that. <laughs> Uh, if I put it to a vote with you and Dasha, I think I'm losing. But um, I yeah, I, I like them because we put the uh, we put the infusion right in the bottom of the sock, and it activates all the receptors in the foot. So, wow. Yeah, so we're seeing really good results with those. Um, and yeah, so that that's what we're doing right now. Currently, we're building out. Um, I have one website called Holotype Labs. Okay. And we're we're putting another one together, which I don't. That might be launched. It might not. I don't know. I love um, <laughs> And we're putting together another website currently called Holotype Health. Mm -hmm. And that one is, there's going to be a charitable aspect to that. We're probably going to take part of our, uh, part of our proceeds each year and donate them. Yes, you are. Of course you are. Yeah. Now all the stuff, I mean, the stuff that you are working on is really, really, really cool, really inspiring, really effective. When I wore your shirt, I mean, I, what was it? It was like a 15% increase in my leg press for Something all like time. That, yeah. And it's not like, I mean, we talk about this, but obviously I've been doing the ARX leg press for how many years now? And so, mm -hmm. you know, every time I get a personal record, it's pretty exciting because I certainly don't get a yeah. personal record, but, you know, maybe like once every couple months I'll hit PR, yeah. High, yeah. Uh, is that common, by the way? Like, is everybody different? Like, what's what do you see with that? Everyone's different, but I mean... It, it matters with the type of programming you're doing. Uh -huh. um, like you guys tend to do mostly like straight reps on the ARX, I notice. Whereas I know like um, like Mike Polano and Jim, mm -hmm. they always play around with stuff. So Polano, I think for a month did all eccentric training on the ARX. Um, Keen did all concentric training, you know, just they were going back and I forth. Do that. I do that too. You know, we try yeah. to control. Someone quacking. I, just, I love. Yeah, it. that's my phone. That's my text tone. Cool. Yeah. Um, so there's a quack. I'm like, yes. That, that. Um, I do. Yeah. No, we do. And it, you know, Alan is great like that too. I don't know how far mm -hmm. um Hera got along with that, but we do we do mix it up because it that you get better results. Like you will. Yeah. You know, inconsistency and in, in tricking the body and just doing eccentric, mm -hmm. just concentric. Yeah, and also like looking at an individual's fiber type, figuring out what's what, what they need to address. But yeah, I mean, I sent shirts to those guys and pretty much every time they wear them, they they go up. Yeah. So, and I mean, no one has more access to an ARX than them. Right, and that's the thing, like people who use the ARXs all the time, it's like, I know, I mean, for me to get a 15% increase on my leg press, mm -hmm. I was like, holy yeah. shit. It was yeah. like, you yeah, it's pretty real. You thought... <laughs> yeah. the other thing that it does too that um it uh it stops your nervous system from getting scrambled from like cellular devices mm. really well that's great How, what, can you buy these now or are they just is it still an experimental stage oh no we have them we have them i can uh i can send them right out i'm, I'm looking at a bunch of t-shirts right now oh okay they're in my apartment with to, me <laughs> we just go to your website yeah, if not, or, um, you know, you could even, if it's easier, I don't know if the website's live, my 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 guy was doing something with it. If you want, I'll give you my contact info, and we can just set something up where you Venmo me, and I'll, I'll mail it oh, out okay. to you. Okay. Okay. And is it, it's H-O-L-O, holo? H-O-L-O-T-Y-P-E. And then labs, plural? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, I will watch it now. Yeah, I mean, you do such, you're, you're cutting edge. You're cutting edge, what can we say? Try to be a little something. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is brilliant. It's really brilliant. Well, thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant. He's also just a delightful yeah. human, really good friend. Like a superhero, basically. I eat a lot of food, too. You eat a lot of food, too. <laughs> How's that going? So are you, how um, kind of strict? You and your duck, how strict uh, are you guys right now on this whole quarantine thing? <laughs> I'm going to shut this thing off. Sure, I like funny. quacking. Um, how stricter am I with like, How are you handling this whole quarantine pandemic situation? Well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm busier than I normally am. Um, just because I normally train groups and now I have to do things kind of one by one. 
-hmm. So I am doing, um, I'm doing a lot of virtual. Um, I also have one or two fields by me that's open. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll occasionally take small groups to the field mm -hmm. and we'll work out there. You know, uh, I bring my own equipment. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because after each set, we do like a, a circuit. Everyone has to wipe down their equipment so the next person can go. Yeah. So we have Lysol wipes everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the police actually come and watch us as their entertainment. <laughs> they think it's great. Well, it is great. I mean, also, I, I mean, I think, I think it's really important to find the middle path where yeah, we're reverent and we're, you know, respectful of this is a new virus and we don't know much about it yet. And, you know, we don't want to all get it at the same time. And if we can possibly not get it, great, let's not. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not a fan of, of fear. I'm just not, I'm not, no. I'm not a fan of any, like, it's a virus, it's in nature, it's here. Um, trusting our body's ability to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. like, like that's part of my kind of core ethos is, is I, I have this body, this body is my vessel for being here on earth. I have to believe in it. I have to 100%. take really good care of it, respect it, make super good choices, make sure I get awesome sleep, drink lots of great water, eat really healthy food and do all the things mentally and of course spiritually to be as healthy as possible. And then I have to trust it to do its job. <laughs> like I have to exactly. like, I'll be like, well, this is what you're here for. <laughs> you know, and either we're going to make it or we're not. But ultimately exactly. I'm like, I'm a big fan of kind of I'm like, well, you know, at a, at a pretty young age, I remember this is going to be, seem like a strange non sequitur story, but I swear it's going to come full circle. But when I was probably around eight, I remember lying in bed, absolutely terrified that someone was going to come in my window and kill me. Cause that's what, when you're eight, apparently that's what you think about. And I was absolutely terrified. And I was at the age where I really wasn't, I was trying, cause that's what I was doing. Still, I was still trying. I was trying to not I was trying to be brave. I was trying to find bravery. Right? I was trying to not call my parents, but I was absolutely freaking terrified. Like terrified. Like I, I swear <laughs> I saw somebody, I could still feel it. Like I was so scared. And then I remember, and I'm not a religious person on any like level. Like I went to church as a kid and I was like, this is not true. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I just, it's not it's not true for me. There were parts of it that I loved. And then there were parts that were like judgmental and like there were limits and rules. And I just don't believe in that. So anyway, mm -hmm. but I remember lying about and being like, well, this is, I don't know what God is and I don't know what, but I, there's something. And, and if this is how I meant to die, like if I'm, if someone, if someone really is going to come in the window right now, because it certainly could be the case, but that's a very, very small chance. But if that really is going to happen and that's what God wants, then okay, then I'm all in, then I'm going to be murdered. And then I went to bed. <laughs> and it was like okay. a pivotal, it was a pivotal moment for me because it was a moment where I found a deeper connection to peace and power mm -hmm. and bravery and surrender, right? Like finding mm -hmm. a deeper connection to surrender when you're little. And that's a strange thing to, I guess, think. But anyway, I connect with that now because I'm like, same thing. Like if I'm, I'm being careful, I'm washing my hands. I'm, I freaking wore a mask when I went to hack today. So it was like on the street, whatever, mm -hmm. washing my hands. I have the Purell. I'm doing all the things. If I forget to wash my hands at any particular moment, or I do forget and touch my face, I was my best. And if I'm meant to get sick, I'm going to get sick. And I'm not, I can't, I can't live in a way that is fear-based. I just, it just does not resonate with my being and I can't do it. And it's yeah, the stress will knock out your nervous system quicker than anything else anyway. Yeah, it's like that. It's like, it, it, I just, it does not agree with me. It does not resonate with my soul to be in a state of fear around this. Like, yes, respect and yes, like pay attention but moment to moment in the present moment, trust that again, my intuition will tell me when to wash my face. My intuition will tell me, okay, you really have to itch your nose. This is the safe time to do it. <laughs> like, I'm again, I, and I really am the thing that I'm, I'm, my intention now is to really, my intention is to integrate my head, my heart, and my gut. And to trust that integration is true and is there. And that's the intention. And Anything that's out of integration, I'm going to get a learning from it and trust that. And, and that's kind of how I'm being. And it's 
tough because my husband and I have a very different sensibility about all this. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky. This is why I've overthought this so much because I've had to explain it. I'm like, I'm a yeah. year old woman. I'm not going to take well to someone telling me to wash my hands. Like, I'm just not. <laughs> Like, just don't. Like, you don't. It's not going to go over well. <laughs> so anyway, but I, you're you're getting out there. You're training the kids still. You're doing sessions. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Got to keep moving somehow, right? Yeah, and you're going to the grocery store. You're. Oh yeah, yeah. I just I put in a large food order just more so because I don't uh, I don't like buying my meat at um, supermarkets. Yeah. So I actually just put in a large order from a uh, bison and elk company. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, bison is great. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, really good. Bison jerky. That's like my favorite. So tender. Really? Yes. Mm. I love jerky. Things to know. Random. Yeah. Yes. They had a lot of really great wild meats when I was in South Africa and they, they smoked them and they were amazing. Oh, I could imagine. Yeah. That stuff's coming right out of, I mean, they're, they're probably getting that stuff about five minutes before you eat it. So you exactly. can't really get much fresher. Yeah. yeah. Over the hell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey guys, went shopping. <laughs> <laughs> oh so are you, do you, um, are you able to work with clients virtually on the computer or do you, they need to see you in person? I have a friend who has, who's got a lot of muscular degeneration from Lyme disease. If I'm, yeah, if I'm going to work on someone, I have to kind of be there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't do that. I mean, with my athletes, I can do it virtually because they kind of understand. And right. they're, they're really just like, hey, I have a tweak. I have a this, I have a that. If it's yeah. something as serious as that, I probably need to get my hands on the person. Yeah, I mean, some of her walking has come back quite a bit, but she still is, you know, she doesn't have a lot of muscular strength from the Lyme disease. Oh, oh, poor thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes so sense. Where in New Jersey are you located? I'm in Waldwick, New Jersey. That's where my facility is. Oh, okay. And it's it's easy to get there from Manhattan or not so easy? It's a little tough. You'd probably need a vehicle. You'd need a car. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's not really... Well, there is a train station, but it's... I don't know. I think it's about a two and a half hour ride. Wow, that's far. <laughs> Just with all the stops and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it brings... The train goes near to your clinic? Yeah, it's not far at all. Oh, okay. I'll let her know because I know she. this is something she hasn't been able to get back since the Lyme disease. And soon okay. enough, we're going to be bringing Mike yeah. into the city more and more. <laughs> oh, are you coming to the city? Yeah. Um, if it ever opens up again, yes. And he's like, not oh, if I We can. will. Of course we're going to. It's when we open up. We're going to open up because we miss hacks and we want to come out. And I miss <laughs> the ARX machine in Allen's. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, to say that might be the only thing I miss from New York City. <laughs> yeah, I know you're not a fan of the city, but Mike, you are. Yeah. You're awesome. So you and, and Hera can exchange contact info maybe in the chat. Sure. Is that, do you have oh, a website? Oh, you Mike, what's the best way to get in touch with like your email? Yeah, email's fine. Mike Hoban at Gmail. No, okay. No dot, right? Uh, dot com. Yeah, no dot, just one word. Okay. All right, I put it in the chat. Mike Hoban at gmail.com. Okay. Yep. So you say it, Hoban. I've been saying your name wrong this whole time. <laughs> no, how do you say it? Hoban? Uh, either or. I, so my kids, well, my kids make fun of me for a lot of reasons, but this in particular, my kids make fun of me because I can't even really hear oftentimes subtle um, like differentiations in pronunciation, like, mm -hmm. like no boo, no boo. Yeah. No boo. I can't even really, my kids are like, you're saying it wrong. And I'm like, it sounds the same. And when I studied Spanish, I would be like, I don't, I don't know. I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And then they finally like, yes, that. And I'm like, I don't know the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I, you, when you said it, I kind of heard a slight Hoban versus Hoban. I, I say, I say both. I say Hoban, Hoban. I mean, so long as you're not calling me jerk or something like that, I'm kind of good. With it. <laughs> like, I really I, have low standards. My intention is to say and spell people's names correctly out of respect because mm -hmm kind of the outward face of their identity so i do, I yeah. do tend to i'm not overly people. concerned like i've asked I, it, but the problem is i also remember things poorly when it comes to sound and so mm -hmm. hara even though i've asked you many times if it's hara or hara every time i say it i always worry i'm saying it wrong so i'm like wait i know <laughs> i asked already 
but am I saying it wrong again? So it's just one of my opportunities. Just think of, just think of O'Hara and leave off the O. Okay. There you go. In. All right. Well, there you guys you are awesome. Mike, thank okay, you so much thank for you. the time. I'm going to share thank this. Thank you so much. This was a great call. Thank you so much. Mike I really loved this. Awesome. I learned so much from both of you. Well, thank you both. I appreciate it. And um, I'll share this and I'll let you know when it, when it gets shared. So if there's cool. anything you want to repurpose. Because once we, we need to start selling your shirts because, you know, that's Definitely. a value. We got to get it out there. Mwah. Definitely. I love thank you. you both. Bye, thank you both. Have a great day. Be you well. too. Be well. Take care. Bye.